Welcome back everybody to our studies in metaphysics. This is our final lesson looking at objects and properties where we're going to focus specifically on the idea of class nominalism. This is just the final of our nominalist principles um, and we'll just go through it in, 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 a brief, in, a, in a brief spell, recapping some of the previous lessons, looking at the objections that you can, that you can levy, or at least one major objection to class nominalism, before setting up the next of our topics, which is going to be topic six, which is going to be the focus on the philosophy of time. This is our final lesson on the subject of nominalism. Like I said, we will talk about the concept of class nominalism. And fundamentally, we've gone through quite a few different theories of nominalism. And just like with pretty much every single theory within philosophy, literally think of a theory and think of a position within philosophy, not just metaphysics, you could think about it in any kind of position. Um, uh, you could talk about it in metaethics, epistemology, philosophy of mind, uh, consciousness, philosophy of language, all of which has its critiques and they have their downsides. That's what makes philosophy simultaneously and rather paradoxically so fascinating on the one hand, but also so unbelievably frustrating on the other. Um, so that's one of the things that's very interesting. And one of the points that I would just like to make as a point of personal preference and a point of personal um, belief is that I'm not ideologically or necessarily philosophically married to any of these ideas about objects and properties. Metaphysics is so unbelievably convoluted and complicated at times that I, 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 I don't even, I can't even begin to um, uh, align myself with or feel charitable towards one theory of, 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 of universalism or nominalism over another. I just, I just don't see a, any of them as being particularly convincing or at least one more convincing than another. But let's just carry on, and uh, the, my, my job is to teach, not necessarily to um, start advocating for my favourite theory of nominalism. Um, and fundamentally, like I've said, previous lessons have been discussing the various types of nominalism. Um, they included things like predicate nominalism, the idea that there is uh, that, that, that fundamentally properties uh, exist as essentially tools of language, and that there isn't necessarily any real connection to, to, to the real world in the same way that a universalist may um, imply or may suggest. Trope nominalist presents this idea of, uh, of properties arising out of the resemblances of tropes. Uh, individual tropes um, that are attached to individual uh, particulars and particular objects, um, but that they arise, that properties arise out of such um, collections and sets of those resembling tropes. Resemblance nominalism seeks to essentially take the position of the universalist, the idea that universalism is proposed on the view of resemblances, and flip it on its head such that the existence of properties is a way of explaining why resemblances exist, but again fails to and struggles to reconcile this idea of how resemblances actually operate between, between different properties without a simple invocation to universalism. Let's talk about class nominalism then. What is class nominalism? And I've inter I've intercut these presentations, which is something I've started to do on on all of the presentations that I've been making for for all of the different subjects that I teach. Um, uh, intercut lots of different interesting pictures and images that sort of resemble uh, in a, in a way the 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 subjects at hand. The fun with metaphysics is that metaphysics is a sort of weird and wacky subject of abstract thinking and 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 and, and as a sort of philosophy of realism and, and, and philosophy of reality in a sense that I can just basically put all kinds of abstract funky looking images on the side and that gives a sort of impression of what metaphysics is and what metaphysics isn't okay so class nominalism then class nominalism is a theory which posits that particular entities which have certain properties may form part of a class of entities of the same property OK. Simply put, that is the basic premise of class nominalism. Um, under this theory, uh, property is simply a class of particulars. So all of the objects that are blue form into the class of particulars that are, are that are all that they're all the, the, the context of, of blue of blue objects. And it is from that that the property of blueness is is explainable. It is explained as a class of these particulars in which everything inside that class is of that similar property, has that property of being blue. 
If an object has a property, then all we are suggesting, therefore, is that the particular is part of the class of particulars uh, that is ascribed to that property. An apple is green, therefore, because it has the property of being green. Um, uh, sorry, an apple is green has the property of being green because it's part of a particular class of objects which are green, a particular set of green things. So fundamentally, in this case, the class nominalist will present an interesting theory for, what, for how one is able to reconcile the existence of properties and resemblances without a specific reference to universalism, which is fundamentally the, 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 the challenge and fundamentally the curse, if you will, of the nominalist from this very beginning. The idea here is that we're trying to think about an interesting theory for how we can reconcile the existence of these entities. Um, and when we look at class nominalism, though, we would suggest that it is parsimonious. OK, um, what does that mean? Parsimonious uh, simply means that we do not need to posit or have any need to posit any new entities for, in order for the theory to operate. This is a particularly good logical solution, given the fact that um, one of the things that we want to make sure that we are able to do in philosophy is to not be positing the existence of new entities to explain theories. Um, and this sort of uh, all ties into, at least uh, uh, at least vaguely ties into the idea of Occam's razor. The idea here is that um, the, the, the theory, then the explanation that is uh, more likely to be true is the one that doesn't posit uh, the, 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 the existence of of, uh, any more than necessary entities so the one that requires the solution that requires the fewest um the fewest assumptions is the one that is more likely to be true and so fundamentally philosophers uh, have been using occam's razor for for millennia as a way to essentially weed out some of the really 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 complicated and convoluted theories that are technically logically coherent but that would posit the existence of thousands of new different entities in order for the theory to actually work we say that with class nominalism one of the uh, one of the things that is particularly uh, approachable about class nominalism is this idea that it's parsimonious um, whereas let's say universalism posits the existence of universals and so therefore you have to justify and you have to present an argument for the existence of these new entities in order for that theory to work which is of course a little bit difficult to do uh, especially when um, you can uh, theoretically present a, a, a theory of, of objects and properties that is parsimonious which is therefore um, uh, requires the fewer assumptions so that's class nominalism. What are the basic problems with this theory? Um, and I'm going to present to you one basic problem with this theory. Um, this is the idea that uh, essentially the class nominalist struggles to uh, be able to reconcile contingency and necessity of properties. So essentially, if we are suggesting that class nominalism is true, then what we are suggesting here is that being part of a class that gives rise to a property is a necessary condition on this account. So the property of blueness is constructed out of the class of all particulars, out of the class of all entities that are blue. But therefore being part of that class is a necessary condition. The entities that are uh, part of that class, the, the particulars that are forming this class of entities which then gives rise to the property are very very important for defining the class itself because if we define uh, that because the class essentially is defined in the theory by reference to what the class is i say that um, for example all things are blue the things that are blue form the class of things that are blue um if I do that, I'm placing a lot of weight on what goes into that class. Everything that is blue goes into that class, which means that in order to be part of that class, you must necessarily have the condition of being blue, having that property such that uh, or having that um, having that uh, general characteristic such that the property of that class is a class of all things which are blue. 
So, or as I've said here, the things being green, the class of being green just contains particulars which are all green. So if you change the entities in that class, you would necessarily change the class itself. If you accidentally put in something that wasn't green, then that is no longer the class of all things that are green because now you've got things that are not green in that class. Logically, it doesn't make sense. But, the, but then the logical consequence of that is that you are ascribing necessary conditionality onto the properties of objects, okay? So it means, therefore, that something in that particular class must necessarily be in that class, and it must necessarily have that property. But then if that is the case, we then have to think about what about the fact that not all properties are necessary. It might necessarily be the case that uh, that some things are blue or that some things have a particular color, but it's not necessarily the case for me being clever, for example, or for you being clever. You might not you might not watch philosophy academy videos, um, and the result of that means that um, you have a property about yourself which is not necessary. It is not necessary that every single person has the property of being clever or being less clever. So. How can um, the accept so we have to accept the existence of contingent properties while also um, requiring necessarily that all properties are necessary? Okay, how can contingent properties also have necessarily been part of the class of properties? That is one basic problem with the theory of class nominalism, reconciling this idea of contingency and necessity when it comes to the ascribing of property for objects. Like always, I would encourage everybody to like and subscribe these uh, to the uh, to this channel and like like this video if you enjoyed it. Uh, like I said uh, in the previous lessons, Louise and Cripps' uh, Routledge introduction to metaphysics is the best, in my opinion, my personal opinion for this particular topic. The next topic we're going to go on to is topic number six, which is going to be examining the philosophy of time and the ways in which time can be represented in metaphysics. Now, I am also acutely aware that I've started many months ago a a series specifically dedicated to the philosophy of time um, which is going to be very different to the lessons that we do on the philosophy of time in this series so whereas in this basic metaphysics course I'm going to be covering the philosophy of time in sort of six or seven lessons doing a basic introduction to the ontology of time the idea of temporal passage a theory b theory eternalism all this kind of stuff um, but the Philosophy of Time series on uh, on the Philosophy Academy, which I will get to in, in, in future months, I'm sure, is going to be a lot more detailed and a lot more specific and focusing specifically on the nature of time itself. So just keep that aware, uh, keep that acutely um, uh about yourself in, in terms of keeping that in mind um, but for now we will be moving on to the philosophy of time in our uh, sixth chapter on the subject of metaphysics 